I've always been able to remember things with a great deal of visual detail. People, scenes, art, graffiti. I've always been able to imagine things with a great deal of visual detail. Shapes, colors, movement. Yet the ability to share this world of personal visual experience with others has been missing for me. For one thing, my drawing skills, which could, in theory, help me externalize visual experience, are close to non-existent. Throughout my years of schooling, all my art teachers agreed on that. What about language, then? Language is such a powerful, expressive tool. Yet even language has its own limitations. And it's not just that a picture is worth a thousand words. It's rather the fact that whenever you try to put a visual experience into words, whenever you try to change the medium of communication, some things will unavoidably get lost in translation or even mistranslated. Well, assume for a moment that we had the means to take this world of visual experience and bring it out for everyone to see. Suppose we could take any memory, any construct of one's imagination, and convert it into a, an image that we can display on a computer screen. From the mind's eye, out into the world for the naked eye to see. Well, that would certainly relieve some of the frustration of not being able to master the, the basics of drawing. More importantly, though, that can provide a new mode of communication, let's say for patients impaired or unable to communicate otherwise. Or it can help bring into existence a new piece of forensic evidence as related to, let's say, the scene of an accident or the face of an individual as experienced by an eyewitness. We could let our minds tell our stories when our words cannot, because we really need to or because we really want to. After all, we all love storytelling. This is what this entire session is all about. The question, of course, is how can we possibly do that? How can we let our minds tell our stories? Well, to get started on that, we have to agree on a basic assumption. The assumption that our visual experience, in all its complexity and magnificence, is just a product of our brains. We see what we see because our minds are in a particular state. My complex pattern of a visual experience emerges from complex patterns of brain activity, from complex patterns of cognitive processing. Does that assumption help? It does, and it should especially since our ability to quantify and record such patterns, whether of the brain or of human behavior. I've seen tremendous gains since the beginning of the century. Irrespective of the specific equipment or technique we use for recording such patterns, the possibility exists that they contain everything we need for the purpose of rebuilding um, artificial replicas, reconstructions of that visual experience we call our own. And I hope the homology is quite clear. Snapshots of our brains, snapshots of neural activity, can be converted into snapshots of our visual experience, mirrors to the world, more or less accurate, depending on context and individual. And then the challenge becomes one of finding and refining the right analytical tools for carrying out that conversion, that reconstruction process. Several labs around the world have been working on that problem, testing different types of equipment, different algorithms, targeting different types of human experience. A while back, I have also taken on that challenge, along with uh, collaborators at University of Toronto here and um, Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. And to better constrain the problem, we chose initially to focus on human faces. Our experience when viewing a face, imagining a face, remembering a face. Not only because faces carry so much meaning to us in our daily lives, but also because we have so much experience with them. They're virtually everywhere. And it turned out that with a bit of work, one can indeed build 
an artificial replica of that visual experience. We can turn patterns of neural activity into reproductions, into reconstructions of visual experience associated with um, somebody's um, experience of viewing a face. Were the results perfect? Were they accurate replicas of what people actually saw? No, and that couldn't be. First of all, because our methods need to become a lot better. This is just um, the beginning of a journey. But also because we have to realize our minds, our brains are not cameras. What we see is an interpretation of reality, not a perfect copy of it. And it is precisely that interpretation that we are after here. What mattered in this case was rather the fact that people could look at these um, reconstructions and they could tell who's who. They could match the individuals. They could recognize them. And that opened the door to a lot of interesting questions. Many of you here may be familiar with uh, Sheldon Cooper PhD. Well, many of our students are. And because of that, we decided to test their familiarity with Sheldon in a number of studies. And one question of particular relevance here is what happens if you take someone familiar enough with Sheldon and you ask him to think of him, to try and remember his face, to picture it in as much visual detail as possible? Can we turn that memory, can we turn that visual experience into an image we can display on a computer screen? And it turns out that we can. We would like to ascribe that success to the uh, methods that we're using, being on the right track, but also, in all fairness, we owe it to our uh, participants being so uh, incredibly familiar with Sheldon. And um, because of that, it seems that Sheldon is slowly but surely becoming somewhat of a mascot or a harbinger of scientific progress uh, amongst us, as weird as that may sound. But before I get sidetracked, let me ask you another question. Whenever you look at something, whenever you try to remember something, you might have the subjective experience of an instantaneous memory, an instantaneous percept, when in reality, those things take time. A percept, a memory, takes time to come into existence. It evolves, it changes content. That we know. What we don't know is when exactly that happens and how it changes shape, how it changes content. For instance, whenever you look at children's face, How long does it take you to form an identifiable mental image of Sheldon? And how does that mental image change? Well, here's a brief um, illustration of what happens from the very moment Sheldon's face falls upon someone's retina until, let's say, about half a second later. And as it turns out, it takes one about half a second, 150 milliseconds, to form a uh, mental image of, uh, of Sheldon. And that experience changes in time, as, um, as anticipated. What we've got here is a window into the microgenesis of human experience, a high-resolution temporal description of how a visual experience forms, how it evolves, and how it eventually fades. Now, again, these reconstructions will need to get a lot better. There's no questions about it, and certainly they will. But this is the beginning of a very exciting journey for us. And I think it's important to know now where we are and where we expect to be in the not-so-distant future. Because this entire enterprise is feasible. It can be made affordable and it can go after many aspects of human experience. So hopefully by now I managed to give you a glimpse into the challenges, the promises, and the implications of this entire enterprise. But before I conclude, let me touch upon a more general note. Our experiences are personal, they're private, and subjective. 
And by being private, by being personal, they make us who we are. They ground our uniqueness, our individuality. They serve to build. Yet on occasion, they also serve to divide, to alienate. And I think this entire enterprise we discussed today can help in that respect. It can bring us closer together when that is what we need. One day, you might be able to share with us a reconstructed memory, a good one. You'll love your friends to see, or perhaps a bad one, the memory of an accident or of a crime that you have to share. One day, you might be able to show us the contents of your imagination, literally painting with your mind as opposed to your hands. One day, you might even be able to post online the dream you had last night in all its visual, surreal bizarreness. One day, I believe that day is soon. Thank you. <laughs>